Hi everyone, my name is Ossie Symbol of Symbol Development. We are the owners and the developers of Marina Lofts. I uh, want to thank all of you guys for being here tonight. Uh, this is definitely an exciting night to have Bjarke here uh, in attendance uh, in what will, I'm sure, be a very promising uh, 45 minutes. Uh, before, I wanna before I introduce Bjarke, I just want to take a moment uh, to thank and recognize a couple of our civic leaders who've been here. Uh, may or may not still be here. Uh, Broward County Commissioner Chip Lamarca, thank you. Um, Planning and Zoning Board Member Michelle Tuggle. Um, City of Fort Lauderdale Auditor John Herbst. And thank you uh, especially to City of Fort Lauderdale staff, um, particularly the urban design and development uh, team, uh, without whose help we would never be here. Um, so when we came to Fort Lauderdale over a year and a half ago, uh, we saw an amazing opportunity to transform a beautiful downtown in a positive and productive way. Uh, we saw an opportunity to create iconic architecture and a world-class community that is uniquely Fort Lauderdale. Marina Lofts is about Fort Lauderdale realizing its full potential. Iconic architecture, affordable luxury rental housing, respect, respecting our marine industry, preserving our historic uses, uh, and being a model for eco-friendly development and creating generous public spaces in our urban core. We have an opportunity here to collectively transform our city. Um, on either July 2nd or August 20th, we're figuring out the dates, uh, Marina Loss will go before city commission for our most important public hearing to date. We will know that evening whether Marina Loss gets approved and moves forward or not. On that, uh, on that evening, the eyes of the world will be on Fort Lauderdale. We ask all of you here, um, who are sitting here, who are enthusiastic about Marina Lofts and, and, uh, and Bjarke Ingalls, to come that evening to City Hall and voice your support. Show the world why our community in Fort Lauderdale is superior on so many levels. Um, our Marina Lofts team are actually in the back who can help guide you um, on how to get there on either one of those dates. So I guess I wanna talk to you a little bit about design and architecture and why is design important? Um, you know, I grew up in a public housing project in Brooklyn, uh, flooded with, with concrete. Uh, there was very little attention paid to design. So when I grew older and started paying more attention to my environment, I realized that our environment affects who we are. When we are in a well-designed environment, we live better and we live happier. And that higher quality of life reverberates to the world around us and effectively creates a better world. So I believe that great design makes a better world. As a developer of design-driven communities, our most important partner in creating great design is our architect. Uh, that's why a great architect is so important to me personally. Why Bjarke Ingels? That's a great question. I'm sure he's asking himself that right now. Well, once, the, once we identified that there was a hunger for exciting and transformative architecture in Fort Lauderdale, I scoured the world to find an architect that could inspire us. I must have interviewed over a dozen world-renowned architects, but when I met Bjarke, I knew right away that he was a perfect fit for Marina Lofts. Bjarke's portfolio of work is in comic book format. How cool is that? His TED.com presentation blew me away. Uh, and if any of you in this room have not seen it, I strongly encourage you guys to go online and check it out. Um, and when I sat with him at our first meeting at a bar in Tribeca, I saw in him a genuineness, a passion, and a real interest in making our world a better place. I consider Bjarke Ingels to be the most exciting young architect in the world. At 38 years old, he's been named by the Wall Street Journal Innovator of the Year, and New Yorker Magazine named uh, predicted that he could one day win the Pritzker Prize, which is like the Nobel Prize in architecture, and could be the youngest ever to receive that award. In the two years since he's been in the United States, Bjarke is redefining the skyscraper in New York City. He's become the lead designer for the Smithsonian Museum's master plan, is a finalist in the $1 billion Miami Beach Convention Center development, and is our architect for Marina Lofts. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you Bjarke Ingels.
It's a, it's a rare occasion to be outshined by your introduction. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Asi. Uh, well, basically, I, I would like to um, attempt to show you uh, um, some, of, uh, some of the work we've been doing over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, and maybe try to sort of describe a little bit in the big picture what could be the role of, uh, of architecture uh, in, uh, in the orchestration of, uh, uh, of human life and, and what could be the role of, uh, of architects. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm the founder of the architecture office, BIG. Uh, we, uh, we moved to America two and a half years ago and, and got incorporated. So when we celebrated our new company status, we had a summer party that was themed BIG Inc. And everybody had to make tattoos. Uh, and Lauren, she won, not for her tattoo, but uh, for sucking up. Uh, <laughs> and essentially, we're a company. We've been around for 12 years in, uh, in, in Copenhagen. These are our Copenhagen offices. We recently moved into this big, nice space, 40-foot uh, ceilings. It's uh, the beer bottle uh, cap factory of Carlsberg. Uh, which is like a perfect place to conceive of architecture. Uh, and, uh, and we also have this office where we are now 65 people operating out of, uh, out of New York. Um, if, uh, if you look at it like in the real big picture, architecture is the art and science um, of constantly trying to make sure that our physical framework, our cities and buildings, fit with the way we want to live our lives. Uh, so that's essentially the, the challenge. We, we have not only the, the possibility, but also the responsibility to make sure that the city we inhabit is actually the world we would like to, to live in. Because uh, like, it's not like God created the cities or anyone else did. We actually built them ourselves. And if they don't fit with the way we want to live, we actually should, uh, should do something about it. Um, and, uh, and if you look at sort of this sort of a, uh, and, and, and the reason we made this, um, this little uh, diagram that shows how cities could actually be almost like man-made ecosystems. So systems of ecology and economy where we channel not only the flow of people, but also the flow of resources through our cities. And the reason for, for this sort of expanded role of, uh, of architecture you can find uh, in, uh, in the atmosphere in this photo. It was taken in Copenhagen three years ago at the United Nations Conference on Climate Change. As, as you can see on the faces of basically all the political leaders, but uh, more than anyone, I think, on Sarkozy. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it wasn't exactly a party. Um, it was a complete failure. None of the goals that were established for uh, for the summit were, were met. Um, and the basic discussion drowned in this sort of misconception that sustainability is a question of how much of our current quality of life are we willing to sacrifice in order to afford being sustainable. Um, so when we were asked to make a proposal for the Danish pavilion for the Shanghai World Expo in 2010 that portrayed uh, sustainable cities, we thought, what about a different attitude towards sustainability? Uh, what if sustainable cities and buildings could actually increase the quality of life? Um, so we try to consolidate all of the elements of a Danish streetscape, complete with the blue bicycle lanes of Copenhagen, uh, allowing the visitors to actually bicycle through the pavilion. Um, in Denmark, or in Copenhagen, 40% of all the people commute by bicycle. So they're never stuck in a traffic jam. We have city bikes, this free system of bicycles we've had for the last 15 years. We just got it in New York now also. Uh, so we allowed people to actually experience the joy of biking through the city instead of being stuck in a traffic jam or being like searching endlessly for a parking spot. You could also bicycle through the exhibition itself, making it the ideal museum for impatient people. Because uh, you could actually see everything in three minutes. Um, and um, at the heart of the pavilion, um, in Copenhagen, our first project that we completed in, uh, in 2002 was the Co Copenhagen Harbor Bath that extends public life into the water because our uh, industrial port has become so clean that you can swim in it. 
so you know you don't have to sit in the car for hours uh, to go to the Hamptons if you live in New York or I mean it's a bit like living in Miami and in Fort Lauderdale basically uh, but essentially we, we try to bring this experience to uh, to Shanghai uh, we sort of put a harbor bath where people could experience how clean uh, if not how cold uh, uh, Copenhagen harbor water is um, and basically like sort of trying to like physically implement all of these elements of um, of examples where a sustainable city also makes it more enjoyable. Um, then we thought, like, how are we going to get all the Chinese to come and experience this? You know, it's cool if, the, if it's there, but if they don't come. And then we started looking for common denominators between um, uh, Denmark and China. And we found that in the public school curriculum, they have three fairy tales by Hans Christian Andersen. Um, so that means that all Chinese grew up with the story of the Little Mermaid, the national symbol of Denmark. So we thought, like, what better way to get them to come than by moving the mermaid to China for six months? Um, when the nationalist, the Danish Nationalist Party heard about this, they're like the equivalent of the Tea Party in Denmark. Um, they tried to pass a law specifically against moving the mermaid. And uh, I had to go to Parliament to argue her case. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we got her. Um, then we had to get her through Chinese customs. Um, and then uh, in, into the pavilion. So, um, actually in her absence, we invited the Chinese artist uh, Ai Weiwei uh, to make, uh, to make uh, an installation as a sort of cultural exchange. And what he did, he installed a Chinese surveillance camera in the pavilion. Uh, it's the same camera that the Chinese state has installed in front of his studio. Uh, he's still in a house arrest, but this was actually part of uh, an installation that he called the Mermaid Exchange, transmitting a, a live image mounted in Copenhagen where the mermaid normally sits, so that uh, people could see that she was, uh, she was okay. Um, but also politically, becoming almost like a loophole in the Great Firewall of China, becoming the only uncensored live TV feed from China to the rest of the world for the six months of the duration. Um, so this was the first time we coined this idea that uh, maybe sustainable cities can actually increase uh, our enjoyment of life. Um, you can say the way we try to work uh, as an architecture office, you can sum it up with what we call sort of knowledge-driven design. Um, that uh, we don't make, so we don't have like a, a preconceived style or aesthetic. Uh, we try in each and every case to sort of analyze what are the what are the key criteria in a specific project? What's the greatest concern? Uh, what's the biggest problem? What's the biggest potential? Uh, and, and try to turn those uh, factors into the drivers of the design decisions. So in a way, each and every design decision is informed with a specific piece of information. Um, so you can almost say that architecture is almost uh, like portraiture. It's like the art of uh, painting a portrait of someone, to design a building for a client or for an institution or for a city or a place, is a bit like painting a portrait. Because like the beauty of a portrait, of course it's in the artist's capacity in expressing him, him and herself as an artist, but maybe more importantly, it's in the artist's capacity in expressing the subject. Um, so, um, in a way, sort of a, a beautiful portrait is 100% the expression of the artist, but also 100% the expression of the subject. Um, and if you, if you like to sort of consider architecture as an art, uh, I think the art that, that sort of interests me is, is often the art that sort of expands your perception of the world or of life or society. Uh, and it, could, you know, it can be like a piece of music that sort of uh, captures noises that you would normally disregard as like noise uh, and suddenly shows you the potential of harmony or it can be like um, um, a, a painter or a photographer that captures elements of light or of the world or of society that you would otherwise be unaware of. But the most important thing is that once you've been exposed, your perception has expanded and you won't ever be able to listen to this noise again without hearing the potential for harmony. So in a way your world gets bigger. And, and uh, 
as an architect, when you are, when you are invited to look at or intervene in a certain situation, you have the chance to try to analyze what are what's going on here, what are the qualities, what are the challenges, and what is the potential. And and when you when you hit it on the nail, uh, you actually sort of um, can can make visible a potential that that was always there but it, it never saw the day of light and people would ignore it and think that nothing had changed and once you sort of uh, capture it and frame it you can suddenly see that uh, uh, that that life is evolving and our city should evolve with it so essentially what i'd like to do now is take you through a series of examples and try to highlight an aspect of each project and showing how this aspect became what uh, created the the architecture um, this is a, a housing project we've done in Copenhagen, the, the VM uh, houses to the left and the mountain uh, to the right. Uh, the mountain essentially consists of uh, 200,000 square feet of parking uh, and uh, 100,000 square feet of housing. I have to say that I actually have an apartment in the VM house. Uh, it's our first project that we built uh, and I just wanted to taste my own medicine uh, and I'm, I'm still practicing. So, uh, But essentially, uh, Next to it, we were asked to do this uh, parking structure with an apartment building next to it, and we thought, instead of having this sort of block of apartments looking at the, uh, a box of cars, why don't we turn all the apartments into penthouses? We follow the maximum envelope of the city code. We even further tilt the apartments uh, sort of to face south. Then we sort of uh, chop up the volume uh, to not block the view from my apartment. Um, <laughs> And, and basically, all of the parking is located on the deep space on the ground, right close to uh, uh, the street. And all of the apartments become like uh, houses with gardens, with a penthouse view, but in the middle of, uh, of the dense city. So it essentially becomes like in a completely flat city, as flat as, uh, as Fort Lauderdale. We make this sort of man-made mountain of homes, uh, where you sort of, uh, your, your kids can run out and play, uh, but you also have a view and you're in the middle of the city. It's made possible because the, the cars occupy all of the deep space to the north. Uh, you have a single funicular elevator that gives access to all the apartments. Uh, and the, to make the parking naturally ventilated and naturally illuminated, we clad it with a perforated aluminum facade. It's the cheapest facade you can put on a, uh, on a building. But because we could vary the hole sizes from very small to a bit more than an inch, and because the holes look dark on the bright aluminum, from a distance it turns into a gigantic artwork for free. <laughs> and, um, and basically you can see where it's dark is where it's more transparent, so at night you can actually see through the building in the dark areas. Uh, and essentially what makes the mountain look different is also what makes it perform different. It's not some strange aesthetic that we've applied, it's essentially what makes the building breathe uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and allow daylight that also turns it into this giant urban artwork. Um, we, we, we call this idea um, uh, architectural alchemy that you can actually create, uh, if not gold, then at least added value by mixing traditional ingredients like parking and apartments, when you put them in together in a new combination, you can actually create something, uh, something else. Uh, we took this idea uh, one step further in a project we've called the Eight House. It's really on the city limits uh, of Copenhagen. Um, it's going to be part of this new dense neighborhood next to the new subway. Uh, and this is where Copenhagen stops and, uh, and, and cattle take over. <clears throat> And, and what we thought, like, when you're building a new neighborhood from scratch, how do you give it the diversity of a historical city? It's, um, it's like 600 feet long, 300 feet wide. Um, basically, we thought, like, why don't we look at the programs? Shops and offices, they like to be close to the customers on the ground. Apartments, they can go on top. They li like, you know, the view and the sunshine. But because residential floor plates are less deep than commercial floor plates, we get space for little gardens, like townhouses with gardens, maybe a small path. Uh, then we add a layer of more classic apartments and then uh, sort of penthouse townhouses. Uh, the master plan asks for a shortcut through the, the building. So uh, we create these uh, little plazas uh, and it becomes a, like a figure eight. And then shops and offices, uh, they like daylight, but they don't like sunshine and glare. You don't want to have like sunshine on your computer screen. 
So to the south, we push them down to the ground, and to the north, we create a, a four-story uh, uh, office building that also brings the, uh, the residential programs into the, the light and the, and the view. And finally, uh, to the southwest, we sort of push the southwest corner down, opening up the entire courtyard to the views, creating this sort of distorted uh, figure eight where you can actually walk and bicycle uh, all the way uh, to the penthouse. So you can say this idea of architectural alchemy, uh, it doesn't only uh, allow you to, um, uh, to sort of maximize the conditions for the different programs. You can see the, the townhouses are lifted up uh, into the, the sun. Uh, the offices uh, become like a, a four-story office building that's like in a co cool, comfortable shade. But also in a new neighborhood, you know, in a traditional city, a new neighborhood, the most important thing is to actually create a community, to create a feeling that this is a real part of the city, to sort of allow people to get to know each other. And traditionally, social life is restricted to occurring at the street. Um, whereas here, uh, um, uh, it's actually allowed to expand all the way into the three-dimensional space uh, of the block. So the eight house is not just like a, a pretty facade or like a sculpture. It's really a three-dimensional urban condition that allows social life to invade uh, all the way to the, to the penthouse and, uh, and back down again. So, um, <laughs> so basically, um, and, and you can say like the whole architecture of the, of the eight house is really about trying to sort of explore and exploit the potential synergies between the different programs that, you know, uh, the different programs can almost like support each other. Uh, where the eight house crosses itself, uh, all of the amenities are put together in, a, in an atrium, uh, sort of connecting the entire building from, uh, from the top to the bottom. Um, and also it becomes like, you can see this is how flat Copenhagen is. It also became a place where people in Copenhagen actually go there just to enjoy the, uh, a walk and the view, because like, it's the only place in, uh, in Copenhagen where you can actually get a view of, uh, uh, of the city you're living in. So um, we recently, uh, we came to uh, America two and a half years ago uh, on the invitation uh, of a developer in New York uh, called Douglas Durst, because I quite often get the objection that these things only work in a sort of a socialist Scandinavian context. Uh, but uh, I think a Manhattan real estate developer should uh, prove otherwise. Actually, um, Douglas has um, a house here, uh, uh, I think to the north of here in, uh, uh, in Palm Beach, if I'm uh, not totally sort of geographically confused. And there's actually sharks in the water, but he says he doesn't care. Uh, he swims anyway because being a Manhattan real estate developer, he gets professional courtesy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this is him saying this. I'm just quoting him. Uh, but essentially, he found this, uh, uh, he had this site uh, on the west side of Manhattan. He'd been trying to develop it for a while, but he, they weren't really uh, uh, getting anywhere. And it's, you know, it's on the west side of Manhattan, like perfect to the south and the, and the west. But the, it's sandwiched between a power plant, a sanitation garage, and the west side highway. So we thought what they really need is like an oasis in the middle of Hell's Kitchen. And this is the, the city block where my dad grew up uh, in Copenhagen. Because in a way, the Copenhagen courtyard with this park in the middle is almost at the architectural scale, what Central Park is at the urban scale, an oasis in the middle of the dense city. So we thought, like, what happens when you combine the density of a skyscraper with the sort of uh, social green space of the courtyard? Or what could a court scraper look like? So basically, we, uh, we, we placed the courtyard next to the Helena. Uh, it's a residential tower owned by our client and named after his daughter. So we try to preserve all of the existing views of the Helena. But still, to give it Manhattan density, we lift up the north corner to 470 feet, uh, maximizing the conditions for daylight and view, uh, creating this sort of uh, like really striking new silhouette uh, on the west side waterfront of, uh, of Manhattan. Basically, from the east, it becomes more like a spire. Uh, and when you uh, enter into the lobby, you have this generous staircase that takes you up into the courtyard. 
that has exactly the same proportions as Central Park. It's just 15,000 times smaller. Uh, and, uh, and it basically goes from uh, 42 inches, the height of a handrail in one side, to 400 feet uh, in the other end. Uh, every, everybody facing south has a, like a, a, a nice balcony or terrace sunken into the roof. Uh, and it's almost like as if the rejuvenation of the, of the waterfront starts like invading the, the city block it, uh, itself. It's, uh, it's currently under construction and should be completed in December uh, 2015. So, so since coming here, we've had a chance to really sort of engage with a lot of different conditions that are completely unlike anything we'd ever encountered in, uh, in Europe. Uh, we met a, a Canadian developer, uh, uh, West Bank, who had a site right where Granville Bridge hits downtown uh, Vancouver. Um, Vancouver is, is, is also sometimes nicknamed Hungcouver. Uh, it has like a, a, a really big uh, Chinese uh, uh, population. Uh, and the downtown is actually mostly residential. All the towers are, are residences. And as you can see, the site was being like shredded to pieces, little triangles uh, by, the, by the bridge. Uh, also, the client had worked on it for a year and a half without really getting happy with, uh, with the results. So we tried to sort of analyze all of the conditions, the setback requirements, the setback requirements from the bridges. There was another 100-foot setback because the city wants to secure that nobody lives and looks straight into heavy traffic. Uh, then there was another setback to secure that we wouldn't cast shadows into the park next door. And finally, we're left with this tiny triangle uh, 6,000 square feet, almost too small to develop. But then we were thinking, if the setback requirements have to, like the 100 foot setback has to do with a minimum distance, as soon as you get 100 feet uh, into the air, uh, you can actually come back out, um, sort of double the size of the floor plate, uh, and maximize the amount of the nicest apartments uh, with the best view. So when you drive over the bridge, it almost becomes as if somebody's like pulling a curtain aside, sort of a Welcome to, uh, to Vancouver. So anyway, what, what makes this building look different is actually also what makes it perform that in a very dense uh, location full of like uh, traffic and requirements, we can actually sort of create like, a really nice place for the, for the people to, uh, to live. It reminded us of the, of the flat iron in New York, this child of a moment in Manhattan history where the real estate uh, value, the steel structure, the elevator suddenly made an undevelopable site uh, suddenly uh, interesting and, uh, uh, and, and possible. And now it's the namesake of a whole neighborhood in, uh, in Manhattan, uh, except in this case, we're taking it like one step further. Um, <laughs> and actually sort of, a, you can have like shops, uh, offices, uh, restaurants underneath the bridge uh, so we're trying to turn the community under the bridges into something uh, sort of lively and, uh, uh, and exciting. Um, and Vancouver has a lot of very significant uh, photo artists. So right now we're having communication with uh, Rodney Graham to look at transforming the underside of the bridge into this uh, street art uh, version of the 16th chapel uh, that the, all the art pieces are actually uh, uh, above you rather than... Uh, on the walls around you. Um, uh, for Lauderdale is sort of unique uh, in a global context that the that the for Lauderdale has found a way of creating this like totally unique form of uh, relaxed living where you can actually have like the American dream of a suburban home with a, a, a yacht in the backyard, <laughs> uh, which is like the sort of a it's the architectural equivalent of. Uh, Surf and turf, I guess. Uh, uh, and, uh, but of course, uh, so far, the, the urban inventions of Fort Lauderdale has been primarily suburban or like low density. Uh, as a result, uh, uh, the downtown has, uh, has sort of um, um, been like maybe uh, un until recently, uh, m maybe the less uh, interesting part of, uh, of Fort Lauderdale. And, uh, and, the, and the ambition of this project is really sort of to embrace uh, this sort of uh, emerging tendency to actually uh, focus on, uh, uh, on the inner city. We're located uh, uh, right uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the New River, uh, these, uh, these three parcels. Uh, when, we, uh, when we met Asi, the first thing we did, we, we went down to uh, uh, 
for Lordale and uh, and walk the site, uh, and the site already had like a, a like a, a lot of sort of a charm, uh, sort of a different forms of uh, of maritime activities, uh, water taxis, uh, uh, a vertical marina. It was kind of a a revelation for uh, for a Dane to see that the uh, marina can actually be this sort of a uh, it's like the the sort of the, the dense urban equivalent. It's actually a three-story parking for boats, uh, and and the and the whole intention was to sort of some uh, some residential neighbors uh, that we some, of course would have to sort of uh, respect and uh, uh, and be friendly neighbors too. Uh, but essentially, the the main thinking was to try to sort of embrace and accommodate all of the culture, all of the life that was already there. So to keep the uh, the vertical marina. Uh, operational and running uh, as part of the spirit of the place uh, uh, to to retain the, uh, uh, the the water element and the the, the the presence of water taxis in the water uh, this big beautiful um, tree uh, we would want to uh, uh, retain and and make sort of an, a significant part of the of the development uh, and essentially to sort of embrace the fact that the, the river walk uh, is this sort of holistic initiative to try to bring uh, a sort of a pedestrian, uh, walkable, uh, lively social neighborhood down to, to the water. Uh, and essentially to uh, imagine marina lofts could be the way of connecting the dots and actually uh, complete the river walk. Also, when you look at the, at the skyline uh, uh, of downtown uh, Fort Lauderdale, uh, you can see this sort of a, a build up towards the, the downtown core. Uh, the downtown core is like literally where uh, we are. Then, when you sort of expand, you have the sort of a, uh, the immediate perimeter, uh, and then you get the sort of uh, the urban neighborhood uh, around it. So there's almost like a gradient towards density, and of course, one of the main drivers of creating a walkable, mixed-use, lively uh, urban environment is to provide a certain density. So there's actually a population uh, uh, to be there. Uh, so we uh, we sort of we try to sort of uh, tailor. If this is like uh, the elevation along the the river. Uh, to tailor uh, our design to sort of uh, lead up towards the, the density of, uh, of downtown. So basically, these this are our sites. Uh, we sort of uh, work with expanding uh, the public realm uh, by encroaching a little bit on the footprints of, uh, of our sites, uh, creating a generous uh, uh, public uh, waterfront. Um, and then the basic idea is to, um, to keep the marina uh, operational. Uh, we sort of imagine to line the entire river walk uh, with uh, uh, our buildings uh, to sort of maximize the amount of, uh, uh, of, of use, of course, for the residents uh, to the water, but also the presence of, of human life uh, on the balconies uh, when seen from the water. Um, then to be a nice neighbor to uh, the Esplanade, we sort of uh, break uh, the building back, uh, creating a, a more generous um, park space on the river walk and preserving all of their views uh, down the river. Uh, and in, in sort of uh, opening up to our neighbors, we also open up uh, this pedestrian uh, connection for, for allowing the entire community to the south to actually come out and connect with uh, the riverfront. Um, in a similar way, uh, we create a, a gate into the marina so you, you'll actually have a building where the boats appear and disappear from the building itself uh, and into, uh, into the water, making the life uh, of, uh, of the area into this sort of urban spectacle. And as an idea, the, the units that we sort of peel out to open up for the boats, we put them together in a small sculpture uh, on the public area to create little restaurants and bars. So in a way, you can say that all of the, uh, of the sort of uh, public promenade, all of the public space, all of the amenities. Uh, we have like a little community or oriented uh, retail and restaurants all along, uh, along the ground floor and in this pavilion to create like a lively destination that not only will allow people to walk here, but also will give people elsewhere a reason to walk over here. So here you can see the, uh, uh, the building volumes uh, in the context uh, of the site how the, the sort of this passage actually becomes the, the main reason for the opening out to, uh, to the water. And, uh, and this, like, this opening becomes almost like a vertical hanging gardens 
uh, for some of the uh, apartments get these like uh, very special uh, uh, terraces. Uh, you get like a nice green uh, promenade uh, uh, along the water. Um, you see this little pavilion that coexists uh, with the marina uh, and boats uh, appearing and disappearing out of the, of the architecture itself. Um, the, the, the big rain tree, uh, we propose to give it, uh, to move it and, uh, and give it uh, a nice park as the main arrival uh, to the community when you arrive uh, from, uh, from elsewhere and not from the Riverwalk. And then you get this sort of pedestrianized streetscape uh, that, uh, that takes you all the way uh, uh, to the water. Uh, and you can see like how like with, within the community that, uh, uh, that this like uh, big vertical opening becomes a, a, a major part of, uh, uh, of the city around it. Um, and you can see sort of even we, we propose these sort of uh, f floating bridge elements that almost appear as if it's like apartments that have fallen into the water and now become the, uh, the bridge that you, uh, that you walk on. And, and uh, this is going to be a successive development. So uh, we also studied that uh, even like phase one is going to look sort of incredibly striking uh, as this sort of, uh, like sort of disciplined slim tower that uh, then has like this sort of sculptural uh, edge. Of course, it becomes... Uh, 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 you know, the reading changes once it becomes like a, uh, this almost like a gateway and finally the, uh, uh, the building that becomes the gateway to, uh, to the marina. Uh, but like e even the first, uh, the first uh, uh, year, like this is really going to be a, a rather striking uh, 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 east-facing facade. So, so essentially the, the main principles we've, we've taken to... Uh, to this part of Fort Lauderdale is really to try to sort of embrace all of the existing uh, qualities and, and characters and then try to take this sort of uniquely Fort Lauderdalean uh, merge of, uh, of land and water uh, and take it from a suburban context and put it into uh, an urban context to create this like really uh, like lively uh, neighborhood in the middle of, uh, of downtown Fort Lauderdale. So as um, and, and here you can see sort of the experience of living in this uh, community uh, overlooking uh, uh, the streetscape and uh, the cityscape uh, around. So as, as Asi mentioned, we, uh, we hope to, uh, uh, to get the final meeting on this project the 2nd of July or the 20th of August. Uh, and I think it could be a, a quite interesting uh, sort of a development of, uh, of the urban, uh, urban history of Fort Lauderdale so far. Um, actually, I consumed my time, but uh, I actually I want to finish by showing you uh, two projects that I think uh, capture uh, somehow the essence of uh, um, of what we try to do. As you can see, uh, in basically all of the work we do, uh, the involvement or the engagement of the public is always a, a significant part of it. Uh, although we are like most most often, we are actually commissioned by uh, by private clients in various ways, but because what we do will eventually become a significant part of the city, we somehow have to uh, try to accommodate um, other desires than, uh, than our own or our clients. Um, in one case, so like, you know, so a, a typical project, our, our first building in Copenhagen, uh, a maritime youth house, we actually turned the, all of the buildings into this sort of man-made dune landscape uh, that becomes like an informal playground uh, uh, that actually sort of, instead of just being clubhouses for, for the boat, actually became like a significant part of the public space of, uh, of Copenhagen. But in one case, we really took public participation to an extreme. Um, these are photos taken outside our office in, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, and, and, and they're not uh, demonstrating against us. Uh, they were uh, young um, uh, Islamic men from uh, our uh, neighborhood, that were protesting against uh, a provincial newspaper in Denmark that uh, made 10 cartoons uh, to make fun of the Prophet Muhammad to show that uh, we can make fun of everything, including uh, other people's religions, uh, pissing off like a billion uh, Muslims. Uh, this is from Syria, and this is uh, outside our office in Copenhagen. Um, at the same time, we got, got invited to look at a former rail track uh, in our neighborhood and to turn it into uh, a, a one-mile-long public park. 
And it was clear that this project was going to be all about creating a, a sense of ownership uh, and integration uh, in this neighborhood. It's the most ethnically diverse neighborhood in all of Denmark. You have more than 60 different nationalities, a lot of them obviously uh, with Islamic background, but essentially 60 nationalities from, uh, from everywhere. Uh, and what we proposed to do was make this sort of simple idea of what we call the red square, the black market, and the green park. And the red square is, is literally different shades of, of red indicating uh, different activities. The black market, everything is black. And finally, uh, the black market rolls in and becomes the, the green park. And within this, I'm just going to explain this one aspect of the project. We thought rather than plastering everything with Danish design, we could actually reach out and explore the ethnic and cultural diversity of the community as a driver for the sort of architectural design of the urban space. Uh, so we basically reached out and asked everybody in the community through the local media, uh, through uh, Facebook, through like, like political meetings, through ads in the local newspaper, uh, to recommend elements from their other home country that they thought could be cool. Because like, it would be strange if the Danes had designed the only nice bench and the only nice uh, lamp and the only nice trash bin. So we got this sort of uh, series of recommendations of things from other cultures for instance, like this Moroccan fountain. And the, and the basic idea is that this has nothing to do with political correctness. You know, we wouldn't eat Indian food or Chinese food to be nice to the Chinese. We eat them because sometimes we really need spring rolls or... Uh, <laughs> and uh, the reason we, that we placed a Moroccan fountain in the, in the heart of Copenhagen is actually because the Moroccans have an amazing tradition for architectural water features. So somebody recommended it and, uh, and we sort of... Uh, we curated uh, all of the recommendations and, and created this nice Moroccan fountain in the black square. Uh, somebody recommended uh, an outdoor sound system from Jamaica. Uh, and uh, you can basically plug in your iPhone uh, and then it, it amplifies your sound. Uh, and you know, the neighbors obviously love it. <clears throat> but uh, the beauty is that we've designed it so that it stays under the maximum allowed limits and it shuts off automatically at 9 p.m. So it's completely within the law. Uh, and, and almost like making it an art exhibition, all of the objects have this little uh, stainless steel plate that says what it is and where it's from in Danish and in the local language. So we have a, a Thai boxing arena from Thailand, obviously. Uh, we have like play uh, 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 things from India, swings from Iraq, uh, this like whole little muscle beach from, uh, uh, from, uh, from Turkey. We have litter boxes cast iron from, uh, from England, of course, uh, bollards from Ghana. Uh, and obviously, because it's Denmark, you need a lot of bicycle parking. This cool one is from Finland. Uh, the sign on the red square is a sign from the red square. Uh, uh, like, check out this bus stop. It's, uh, it's from Kazakhstan. It's like way cooler than anything uh, we we've, we've normally have. We found this uh, elephant slide in uh, Ukraine. It's actually from Chernobyl. So we had to, uh, we had to make a replica because the original was radioactive. Uh, uh, and uh, like even down to the manhole covers, uh, we have like this nice one from, uh, from, uh, from France, from Switzerland. And because like a lot of the, uh, the local immigrants are Islamic background, we chose an Israeli object that is completely indestructible. Uh, uh, we even found palm trees in China that naturally grow in a Danish climate. So now we have, uh, they're from uh, uh, like the same climate zone, uh, hemp palms they're called. We have this beautiful uh, glass fiber octopus plaything from Tokyo. Uh, and when you go there, it's really like a display of the cultural diversity and showing that, you know, like playing is like a complete way of bridging uh, uh, barriers of language and, uh, uh, and culture and, and religion. Um, when you look at the benches, it becomes like a social study of the different nationalities. This is a, like a love seat from Mexico, like an S-curve that allows you to watch the person you're sitting next to into the eyes. Uh, from Belgium, a bench where everybody looks away from each other. Uh, 
so uh, you know, it just becomes like this like really incredible display of like these sort of everyday inventions of uh, of different cultures. <clears throat> and finally, we took it all the way into the lighting. And one of the main reminders that you're in a foreign culture when you're traveling is actually the advertisement. So as a series of sculptural lamps, we have very little uh, neon advertisement in Denmark because a lot of uh, places uh, prohibited, including Copenhagen. Uh, so we actually have a series of sculptural lamps that advertise stuff, stuff you cannot buy in Denmark. Uh, so obviously a sign to American culture uh, in the park. Uh, I'm suspecting that some, like, uh, some entrepreneur would one day open uh, uh, DeAngelis Donuts nearby because he has like free advertisement. Um, there's like my favorite, my mom's a dentist, and this is a dentist from Qatar. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the red square has a series of like elements from uh, from uh, former Soviet or uh, socialist countries. And we even have a, an app. Uh, we, we, uh, we did it together with the landscape architects Tobotech Eins and uh, Superflex, the artist group. And the app uh, basically allows you to uh, see what the different elements are and read the story of where it came from and how it was recommended and why is it here. So in a way, like an example of like almost turning the authorship over to, uh, uh, to the users as this sort of uh, excursion and extreme uh, 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 public participation. Now I'm going to fast forward so you'll just enjoy the images. This is uh, the National uh, Art Museum of Greenland. This is uh, a museum we're doing uh, next to P Prince Hamlet's castle, Kronborg. I'm just getting to the last one. Oh yeah, maybe I'll show this. I, I realized that actually uh, everything we're doing in, in Denmark is underground. Uh, I don't know what to uh, conclude from that, but this is my old high school, and I got uh, approached by my old math teacher to see if we could make a new sports hall for them. Um, and the only place that there was space was actually on the football fields, uh, and I wouldn't exactly win uh, a popularity contest if I sacrificed the soccer fields. Um, so we propose to put it uh, underneath the courtyard of the, of the school. Um, basically the canteen is, uh, um, uh, is in the courtyard. And um, because it was my math teacher who gave us the job, um, the rules of handball, it's a handball arena, it's a Danish sport invented by a Danish soldier, but you need 15 feet uh, on the perimeter and 30 feet in the middle. Um, so we just use the, the formula for uh, a ballistic arch to sort of uh, design the, the ceiling uh, of, the, of the sports hall. It, it becomes like this, almost like a social molehill. Uh, we, we put like various kinds of furniture, like a melted bench, uh, a ring of, uh, of, uh, of chairs with the little tables, uh, like this sort of outdoor auditorium. Uh, and uh, it has really sort of exploded the use of the courtyard. Even though you would feel that it actually occupies the courtyard, it actually makes the courtyard much more inviting. The wooden, uh, the wooden surface serves as a, as a bench on the edge and as this like a uh, hillside where people sort of lay down and uh, enjoy the, the sunshine when, uh, when that happens. <laughs> and, uh, and inside, it's actually the sort of uh, the mathematics of a thrown handball that creates this sort of a beautiful curving uh, roof. You have uh, skylights along the perimeter that washes the walls in, uh, in daylight. And you end up getting this like, very expressive uh, curve that is purely expressing uh, the actual sort of uh, 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 the space that a thrown handball uh, needs to, to be able to, uh, to, uh, to reach the back line. Um, and at night, uh, all of the furniture has the illumination, so there's no specific lights, but all of the furniture actually creates like a halo uh, of light uh, around them. And, and I must confess, it gives you incredible pleasure to, uh, uh, to, to, to mess up your old high school. The, the construction phase was like two years of like uh, disturbed uh, uh, classes. Um, the, the last, as a sort of prelude to the last project I want to show is that um, also like, you can say like this idea that even though there's a lot of private initiative, um, you always have the possibility of like creating uh, public benefits when you're, when you're working, like in the case of, uh, of Fort Lauderdale. Um, and it's these hybrids that always interest us. Um, 
Uh, one example, which is like almost like a hybrid between infrastructure and, and culture, uh, is a project we're doing in a sculpture park uh, in Norway. Um, the sculpture park was on two different sides of a river, um, so you would have to like move around, and we, we, we were like free to place the museum where we wanted. So we actually placed it as a bridge spanning uh, across the, the river. Um, so very simply, when you sort of uh, when you move through the, you know, you have a flat area on one side and a steep uh, hillside on the other. So the building sort of uh, accommodates the, this change of grade by turning. So essentially a skylight becomes a panoramic window. You enter into a, a, a very vertical space of galleries where the building turns. You see this fanning stair that connects the different uh, galleries. The skylight pivots and becomes the window looking at the old mill. And essentially, it ends up being like a, almost like a hybrid uh, of like a, a museum building, a bridge, and a sculpture. You can almost see it as the biggest sculpture in the sculpture park. And depending on when you uh, and where you see it from, you might not know that it's a museum uh, until you actually uh, have to pass through it. And I think that brings me to the to the last project that I'd like to uh, to show, which is our biggest project to date, uh, and which could be the future landmark of Copenhagen. Um, it's right on the waterfront of Copenhagen, right in the middle of, the, of downtown. This is the opera, the, the Royal Theater in downtown. Um, but it's not a royal palace and it's not a cultural palace. It's a power plant that turns all of the waste of the inhabitants of Copenhagen into uh, energy and heating. So essentially six pounds of household waste turns into four hours of electricity and five hours of heating. Seen as a resource, a ton of trash is one and two thirds of a barrel of oil. Uh, so it's an incredibly valuable resource if you harvest it. But of course, it's a big, ugly power plant. It's uh, gonna be the tallest and biggest building in, in Copenhagen. It's gonna be right next to the marina and right next to where the local boys go water skiing. So we were thinking like, how can we make this a contribution to the community and not just a big box that blocks the view and casts shadows uh, on the neighbors. Danes love skiing, but as you saw, we have, we have snow, but we have absolutely no topography. We have no mountains, but we have mountains of trash. Um, so uh, people happily go six hours by car to Barnes in the south of Sweden. And because of the sheer magnitude of our building, it's more than 300 feet tall, we can actually uh, do two thirds of barnes on the roof of our building. So basically we know how big uh, the different machinery is gonna be. So we create a continuous roof, a single elevator takes you to the roof where you have uh, uh, like a green and a blue ski slope uh, going all the way down. Um, miraculously, we won the competition based on, uh, on this idea. So from 2016, you're going to have to look out for the Danish competitors in alpine skiing, because now we can actually practice at home. Um, it really becomes like a, a, an accessible uh, public park that sort of brings a new landscape quality uh, uh, to Copenhagen. The facade, we also imagine almost like a, uh, like a, you know, a cliff. Um, you know, these are cliffs from the Faroe Islands with birds nesting. Uh, that the facade actually has planters that filter the, uh, the daylight into the, into the plant. We're doing uh, facade tests for the manufacturing. But basically you can see, um, you know, basically this diagram I started showing, like this idea of trying to imagine our cities and buildings like man-made ecosystems is, uh, is very close to coming to completion here. We harvest the local resources, the water, uh, for the facade and for the utilities inside the building, the daylight, the chimney effect of natural ventilation, but also together with the city of Copenhagen, that the building actually becomes like almost like a metabolism that transforms the waste into a renewable e resource of, uh, uh, of electricity and, uh, and district heating. Um, this is gonna be the cleanest waste to energy power plant in the world. So the smoke that comes out of the chimney is completely non-toxic but it will still contain a small amount of CO2, uh, much less than any existing power plant, but still there'll be some CO2. Uh, so um, there was like a, a resources for an art budget or an art project. So we worked together with Realities United out of Berlin, 
and designed the mouth of the chimney in such a way that it accumulates CO2. And when there's half a ton, it puffs a gigantic smoke ring. <laughs> so uh, of course, like on, on one hand, we like this idea that it's the ultimate artistic expression of hedonistic sustainability. Uh, because, uh, you know, it turns something that used to be a problem, uh, pollution, into something playful that actually puffs smoke rings, which is also why you can ski on the roof of it. Uh, but also, uh, and more importantly, one of the main drivers of behavioral change is knowledge, that if people don't know, they can't act. Understanding always pre uh, precedes action. And like I explained, our approach to architecture is this idea of knowledge-driven design, that specific information informs our decisions. Uh, and in a way, CO2 emissions is so abstract that nobody understands what it is. Uh, but from 2016, and if you come to Copenhagen, if you want to know what a ton of CO2 is, all you have to do is look at the sky and count the smoke rings. And each time you count two smoke rings, it's one ton of CO2. So in its way, it's sort of projecting the carbon footprint of our lifestyle onto the skies of, uh, of Copenhagen. So I think with the... With that as the last image.